The word ego has two main meanings, which is a source of a lot of confusion, as people get the meanings confused. There's the bad ego and the good ego. The bad ego is the one who's selfish, doesn't care about the needs of others. It's a very high opinion of him or herself, and a low opinion of everybody else. And then there's the ego that's a necessary part of your mind. That's the ego that the psychologists talk about, the one that has to negotiate between your sense of what you should do and your sense of what you want to do. Because sometimes the shoulds can get awfully oppressive. And you've got the wrong set of shoulds in your mind, the wrong set of obligations that you feel. They can wear you down. On the other hand, if your wants take over, they have no rhyme or reason at all. They can destroy your life. So you have to figure out some way to negotiate between the two. This is the kind of ego you need, and you need to train it to be healthy. Because negotiation requires a lot of skill. Years back there was a psychologist who wrote a book about five healthy ego functions. And it turns out they all correspond to things in the Buddhist teachings. The first is anticipation, which in the Buddhist teachings is heedfulness. The ability to see that there are dangers down the right, and if you don't get your act together, you're going to suffer. You have to have that sense of self in order to function properly. And you have to be able to use it to overcome your desires just to do whatever you want without concern for the future. The second function is altruism, which in the Buddhist terminology is com compassion together with goodwill. You realize that your happiness cannot depend on causing harm to other people. So when you're quest for happiness, you have to take their happiness into consideration. Be sensitive to their needs. This too is a healthy ego function. The third quality is suppression. Your ability to say no, either to desires that are wrong or to your sense of obligations that may be wrong. Now, suppression is different from repression. Repression is when you deny that something is there. Of course, when you deny it, it turns in, goes down underground and turns into the thing, comes up someplace else. You suppress something, you know it's there, but you just consciously, consciously say no. And if you're skilled, you can be effective. But you need the assistance of a fourth function, which is called sublimation. In other words, when you're denying yourself an unhealthy pleasure, you should find a healthy pleasure to put in its place. Now, Buddhist terminology, suppression is restraint. And although they don't have a term for sublimation, the practice of concentration, what you're doing right now, is a kind of sublimation. You're trying to find a healthy pleasure, a pleasure that's harmless. Doesn't harm you, doesn't cloud the mind, doesn't harm anybody else. You're sitting here just breathing, but you're able to find pleasure in that. And you develop, if you develop that skill, it becomes an important tool in your arsenal when you're dealing with obstreperous emotions. The ones that constantly want to be fed, they want their pleasure right now. They don't care about the future, no matter how much your anticipation heedfulness is telling you that you've got to prepare for the future, there's part of you that says no. And this is where the ability to tap into a source of pleasure at any time becomes an important tool in your negotiation. You can say, look, have this. Feed off of rapture. Feed off of pleasure. Take the rapture and let it fill the body. Take the pleasure and let it fill the body. Why do you need to go off and do that unskillful thing? So this too is an important ego function. And then the fifth that the psychologist listed was humor. 
your ability to laugh at the stupidity of your desires or the stupidity of some idea of what you should do that you picked up from who knows where, and you begin to see as you get things into perspective that it's actually oppressive and actually doesn't serve any purpose. You can put it aside. Again, the Buddha doesn't talk too much about humor, but there are fine examples throughout the canon of his use of the right kind of humor. The good natured laugh at human foibles. And you can laugh at your own foibles, laugh at your own defilements. That weakens them quite a bit and it puts you in a good position. You separate yourself from them. Because to laugh at a situation, you have to be able to stand outside of it. It's like reading Petit Nicolas. Here's a little kid. He's not trying to be funny, but he reports what's in the situation. And we're the readers. We're standing outside. We see, ah, there's humor in that situation, even though sometimes the people in the situation are not finding it funny at all. And your ability to stand outside is what gives you strength in dealing with your own defilements. Now, there's a fourth quality the Buddha talks about as being important as part of your healthy sense of self. It was interesting that the psychologist didn't mention it. Because he does make the point in his book that, especially in adult personality development, someone who's at develop, development who's arrested at childhood and needs to enter the adult world, usually needs someone to give him confidence, or give her confidence. He gave the example of Tolstoy, who as a youth was not much. But his wife gave him a lot of strength and a lot of encouragement. And ultimately he became a great author. Now the Buddha actually talks about this, the need for confidence on the path, your need to believe that you can do this. Perhaps one of the reasons why the, the psychologist didn't mention confidence is that it can be used in either way. In other words, it can be used for unhealthy ego functions or to support healthy ego functions. But it is necessary, especially when you're on the path like this. There's times when it seems really difficult and you wonder if you have it in you. Can I do this path? You've got to have that sense that, yes, I can. There's a path, <clears throat> passage where Ananda talks about the need for conceit, as they call it, your ability to compare yourself with others and to make the comparison useful. In the sense the comparison is this. Other people can do this. They're human beings. I'm a human being. They can do it. Why can't I? He says you need to have that much conceit, that much confidence in yourself in order to do this. You look at the teachings of the forest of Johns. The huge volumes now, say, of Ajahn Mahabua. A huge percentage of that is encouragement. We hear about Ajahn Mun setting very high standards for his students, but at the same time encouraging them that yes, they could do this. Here they were peasants. Many of them had very little education. They're at the bottom of the rung in the Thai social ladder. And they've been taught pretty much that you can't do this, can't do this, can't do this. But here John Munn was saying, yes, you can. You've got what, you, what it takes. The 32 parts of the body we chanted right now, you've got all of those. You've got a mind. You've got what, what you need. It's simply a matter of putting it together. Now, the psychologist who was doing the study, the ego, commented, though, that the support you need, the confidence you need in order to manage your development well will take time. The confidence has to be there all the time. And so you have to learn how to give yourself pep talks. There are times when the practice goes well and you don't need to give yourself much encouragement at all. Other times when it's going very poorly. And that's when you have to learn how to pull on these other ego functions. Humor is an important one. The story I read years back of the first Englishman who went across the Northwest Territories. He went with a band of Dene. The first Englishman to entrust his life to a group of Native Americans. 
And he noticed that on the days when they were hungry, when their hunting didn't get much for them, that was in the days when they tend to, those were the days they tended to joke the most, to keep their spirits up. Some days when your meditation isn't going well, try to give yourself a good-natured laugh. Find something in the situation where you can see that there's humor in it. And that pulls you out of the doubt that's been debilitating you. You can use heedfulness to motivate yourself. You can use compassion. That whatever little effort you put in, every effort is effort well spent, and it's going to be rewarded by putting your mind in a better position, putting you in a position where you're not going to be quite so irritable with other people. See each step of the path is worthwhile, as having good consequences. This is where heedfulness comes together with compassion. Because heedfulness without compassion wouldn't mean much, but wanting to have compassion for yourself, not only now, but on into the future. That's what gives heedfulness its energy. So remind yourself that you've got what it takes. And even though things may take a while, that doesn't mean they're not going to develop. Our problem as a society is we tend to focus on things that can be done instantly. You want to be a good cook, all you have to do is pick up a copy of Julia Child and she's done all the work for you. All you have to do is follow her instructions and you can come out with something really good. Sometimes we don't even want to wait that much. We want instant pleasure, instant skill. And our education system tends to encourage us. It channels us in the areas where we're talented. And the implicit lesson is that the things you're not talented at, well, someone else will take care of those for you. But here's something that no one else can take care of for you. The skill with what you treat, your thoughts, your words, your deeds, the skill with what you encounter, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. That's a skill you have to develop on your own. No one can do it for you. And it does make a big difference in your life. So whether it takes a short time or a long time is not the issue. Just keep at it. And learn to give yourself strength along the way. <laughs>